Good morning. We welcome you to this Easter morning service. He is risen. I hope you are able to respond. He is risen indeed. We're looking forward to worshiping our risen Savior this morning. And I invite you to join with me in praying, in reading the scriptures, in singing, and in considering the implications of Christ's resurrection for our time. Normally we would begin a service with sharing notes of praise. And I want to just thank the Lord that Jan Cushing has made it through her heart pacemaker operation as she's home. She's telling me that she's well and appreciates all of our prayers. Thank you for praying for Jan. Let's continue to pray for her as we anticipate the Lord helping her in recovery. This morning, the call to worship is from Psalm 22. I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 22, a psalm that has Christ's cry of dereliction from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But a psalm that also turns a corner right in the middle and looks forward to the resurrection and all that that, all the hope that that offered Jesus. So let's look together at Psalm 22. I'm reading this morning from the New American Standard Bible. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, the reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. And that was exactly what the people said to Jesus as they were standing around seeing him crucified. But he continues, Yet, verse 9, You <clears throat> are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. And I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answered me. And right there in the middle of verse 21 is where the psalm turns a corner from Christ's death and suffering on the cross to God's answer to him. And from verse 22 on is a psalm of praise of God's deliverance, how God has delivered Jesus. Look at verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brethren. How can he tell of his name to his brethren if he's dead? So the implication is he's alive. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. 
for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will pay my bows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth. Here comes the universal gospel promise. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. Those who go down to the dust will bow before him. And then verse 30 is striking. The New American Standard says posterity will serve him. The Hebrew, a seed will serve him. That promise of a of sons and daughters, posterity will serve him, it will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. May God add his blessing to the reading of Holy Scripture. I invite you to sing now together, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Thanks to Grace Community Church and the congregation for making this version of Christ the Lord is Risen Today available online. Let's join together and sing this celebration of Christ's resurrection.
Hallelujah. Christ is risen today. Let's join the saints of all the ages in affirming our faith together as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's time for our praise and prayer. I've already mentioned the note of praise that Jan Cushing is doing well, and we're delighted with that. I've heard from a number of different people in the congregation, Helen Green and Chris, and Peggy, and Donna. Thank the Lord that he's sustaining and helping each one of you during this difficult time. We want to pray together that the Lord would strengthen us, strengthen our focus on him, strengthen our trust in him. He said, don't be worried about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's go to him this morning with thanksgiving, confident of receiving his peace. Our Father, we enter into your presence on this Easter morning with gladness in our hearts. How we rejoice that Christ is risen, that the tomb is empty, that we who once were dead because of Christ can now be alive, that we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We thank you that you've told us that the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in us, and his power is extended to us to enable us to live the life that you want us to. How we bless you this morning. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you have redeemed us, rescued us, and you're preparing a place for us. And you tell us, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have the hope and expectation of your soon return. All those who hear my voice and those who may not hear this, that you would strengthen them in grace. Would you provide for their needs? Thank you that your promises that as a father cares for his children, you care for us as your children. Lord, our confidence is in you. Our trust is in you. I pray that you would rebuke the enemy who does his best to discourage your people in times like these, to get their focus on the circumstances, get their focus on their inabilities or the the what-ifs of the future. And instead, Lord, we want our eyes to be fixed firmly on you, remind, remembering that nothing is difficult for you and nothing is beyond your power. For those who've experienced physical sickness, I pray that you would grant them healing. For those who have financial, emotional, or spiritual needs, I pray that you would meet those needs. You know, the special on green mentioned on Facebook the other day, we pray that you would grant uh, your grace and special work in that particular situation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, you have provided a pattern for us to pray, and we pray that together as your people. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We rejoice that, as John says in 1 John 5, 13, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us, and that if he hears us, we have the petitions we have asked from him. Now we're not together to pass the plates for the tithes and offerings, but let me just remind you that you can mail in your offering, as I have, to P.O. Box 13, Morning View, Kentucky, 41063, and address it to Morning View United Methodist Church. Thank you for your giving and your support of the church at this time. I'm calling your attention this morning to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, a classic passage on the resurrection of Jesus, verse, beginning with verses 12 to 19. 12 to 19. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Moreover, we are false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if, indeed, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now why did Paul say that if we have hope in this life only, we of all men are most to be pitied? I believe he said that because Paul's understanding is that as Christians, the world hates what we stand for because the message of Christianity is that men are sinful and God is holy. And a holy God cannot live with or accept sinful men. But God provided a means for sinful men to come into relationship with him, sending his own son to die on a cross for their sins. But the cross is to the Jews a stumbling block and to Greeks foolishness. And so the Christianity that Paul was preaching, was representing, and spreading around the first century was hated and persecuted. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, Paul says, why in the world are we giving a life for something that has no hope. That isn't true. Why should we preach a gospel that results in us being persecuted, harassed, stoned, beaten? If Christ be not raised, we are of all men most miserable, he writes to the Corinthians. You know, we're living in unprecedented times in the 21st century. And as I was thinking about the fact that I can't be in the pulpit sharing this message with you personally because of the coronavirus, I thought, you know, the coronavirus brings to light our mortality. All of us will die, and some are dying sooner than they thought. But Easter, the resurrection of Christ, reminds us that for those who trust alone as their only sufficient sacrifice, there is immortality coming. For what is sown in mortality will be raised in immortality. The coronavirus reminds us of death. We keep watching the death toll climb higher every day. But Easter reminds us that Jesus conquered death. 
And he stands before John on the Isle of Patmos in, in that vision and says, I hold the keys of death and hell. Death is not an enemy to Jesus. It is a defeated foe. Jesus has conquered death. The coronavirus raises questions about judgment. Is God judging the world? But Easter reminds us that God has judged sin in the person of his son, Jesus. And he has made a way for everyone who will accept Jesus as their savior to live a life free from the power of sin. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 that we have been raised with Christ. We who have been baptized into Christ have been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. Therefore, sin shall not rule over you. I think the coronavirus reminds us that this world is cursed. We live in a fallen world where the effects of sin impact not just people who commit sin, but all of nature. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that the whole creation groans and travails, waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. And Easter reminds us that God who raised his son from the dead will raise us from the dead someday so that we will no longer be under a curse. In fact, Easter is the foretaste, the first fruits of the resurrection that is to come. Jesus, who is the second Adam, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. The Adam who got it right, as opposed to the first Adam who messed it up. The second Adam, by his death and his resurrection, has made a way so that all men who place their faith in him will be raised to a world in which there is no death, there is no sorrow, there is no more pain, peace and righteousness the world over. And for that, I say, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and we have great hope. I want to spend some time thinking with you today about the resurrection. The resurrection is a historical fact, not just a theological belief. I've been reading news reports and hearing commentators talk about a resurrection of the American economy. And while all of us will be glad if and when things return to normal, economically, resurrection is not about economics. Resurrection is about something far more serious, far more profound than the exchange of goods and services. But oftentimes people wonder, how do we know that Jesus even lived? I mean, hasn't modern science disproved the possibility of a resurrection? And I'd like to spend just a few minutes here talking about the historicity, the fact of the historical resurrection of Jesus. We know that Jesus existed the same way that we know Alexander the Great or Caesar Augustus existed. There are historical records and documents that testify to his life. Now, most of what we know about Jesus is contained in biographies that were written in the first century. There were biographies written by Matthew, by Luke, by John, by Mark. We have letters from Paul and Peter, all of who testify. But a lot of people tend to view those biographies and letters as suspect because they've been recognized by the church as part of the canon of Scripture. And so the question is raised, Are there is there any historical evidence for Jesus' existence outside the Bible? And yes, in fact, there is a great deal of historical evidence. Around the year 93, a Jewish historian called Josephus mentioned 
mentions Jesus' name twice in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. Let me just read you a couple passages from Josephus. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him many, both of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, that is the Jews, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophet had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. And in another place, Josephus writes, He brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, and delivered them to be stoned. So Josephus testifies to the existence of Jesus and James. Twenty years later, Tacitus, a Roman historian, wrote a book surveying the history of Rome, and in it he described how Nero, a Roman emperor, quote, punished with every refinement the notoriously depraved Christians, as they were popularly called, end quote. And Tacitus goes on to say that Quote, their originator, Christ, had been executed in Tiberius' reign by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. End quote. That was in Tacitus's Annals, 15.44. Uh, one more, Caesar specifically mentions Christ and his followers. He wrote, for example, quote, because the Jews at Rome caused contentious disturbance at the instigation of Crestus, the Latin form of Christ, he, that is Emperor Claudius, expelled them from the city. You know, men who've spent their lifetime studying the historical basis for the resurrection, among them Gary Habermas, tell us that we have better historical documentation for Jesus' existence than for the founder of any other ancient religion. So, from a historical perspective, the resurrection, the existence of Jesus and his resurrection is not simply a matter of religious belief. It's a matter of historical fact. And that matters for several reasons. It matters be Jesus' claims. Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life that no man can come to God through him. He claimed to be the prophesied son of man who will sit at the right hand of God the Father. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the I Am who existed before Abraham. Those claims, as C.S. Lewis famously put it, either make Jesus a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. And his resurrection validates that Jesus was indeed who he said he is. He is the Lord. Not only does the historical fact of the resurrection validate Jesus' personal claims, it fulfills prophecy. For as Isaiah prophesied, Jesus see his seed after he had died. That is, Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11 and 12 point out that the Messiah, who was going to die for men's sins, would rise from the dead. And Jesus fulfilled that and many other Old Testament prophecies concerning his death and resurrection. So in light of the historical fact of the resurrection, how should we respond today? Well, when Peter was asked, what should we do as he preached on the day of Pentecost, his response was, repent and be converted and be baptized that your sins may be blotted out. When Thomas saw Jesus, he knelt before him and said, my Lord and my God. The resurrection of Jesus means that Jesus alone is worthy of our worship. That Jesus truly is who he said he was, the Holy One of God sent to 
as the Lamb of God to bear the sins of the world. I think the most appropriate response we could have on an Easter Sunday if we don't know Jesus as Savior is to repent of our sins. Say, Lord Jesus, you rose from the dead so that I might have not just physical life, but spiritual life. And I want to repent of my sins, place my faith in you, and begin to follow you as my Lord and my God. If you've already done that on this Easter, then the resurrection is a time of great rejoicing, a time of delight, of remembering that we have hope. We live in a world where there's not a lot of hope because they're not, they don't have their eyes fixed on eternal things. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. God wants us as his people to not allow the problems of the life that we face to distract our single-minded focus on Jesus who has finished the race and is set down at the right hand of the Father having conquered sin. His conquest means that you and I too can conquer because he is making intercession for us. First response would be repentance. The second would be refocusing on Jesus. And the third, I think, is Recommit to sharing the good news that Jesus has risen from the grave. The tomb is empty. He is alive. And we have reason for great hope.